This material is made available to you by or on behalf of the University of Melbourne under Section 113P of the Copyright Act 1968. It may be subject to copyright. For more information, visit the University Copyright website. Let's make a start if we could, please. Um, I'm John Tobin, professor at the Law School, and with my colleague Larry Charlesworth, who is somewhere floating around, we co-direct the rights program. Um, firstly, thank you so much for coming. Um, we thought tonight with the rain and the cold weather we might sort of see half of the registration list disappear, but to your credit, you're all committed to the cause, so thank you so much for being here tonight. It's a really huge effort. Um, in terms of my role, to introduce our guest speaker, but of course, first I'd like to acknowledge we meet today on the traditional grounds of the Rundry people, the Kulin Nation, and we pay our respects to their eldest past, present and emerging. I'd also like to, I suppose, stop, pause and reflect and acknowledge the life of that young woman Courtney Heron, who died so needlessly in an act of violence very close to this law school just this weekend. Far too many acts of violence, far too many women and children suffering, and as a community, as a society, as a law school, to reflect on what role we have to play moving forward to stop this happening. Um, enough is enough. Um, this event is actually co-hosted by my colleagues at the Rights Law Centre, so Tom and Karen in the front row over there are here with us this evening as well, and the Institute for International Law and Humanities, and of course Melbourne Law School. So thank you to Connor for putting on the event and supporting us as well, otherwise it wouldn't take place. Um, my role is to introduce to you our guest this evening, Professor Cesar Rodriguez Galavito. Um, he comes with high acclaim. His CV reads like the CV that most of us would like to have. He's co-founder and senior researcher at the Centre for Law, Justice and Society, and founding director on the program of Global Justice and Human Rights at the University of Andres, Colombia. He's also, and I think importantly, the founder of Just Labs, a space for incubating innovations and collaborations in the field of human rights. He's actually here in Melbourne working with my colleagues at the Human Rights Law Centre on some projects as we speak as well. He's co-editor of Open Global Rights and of Cambridge University Press's Globalisation and Business and Human Rights book series. He's been a visiting professor, not just here, but at Stanford University, Brown University, New York University, University of Pretoria, and the list goes on. He's a man in, de man in demand. In fact, Cesar is one of those very rare academics who traverse both the world of academia, but also advocacy and activism. And I think that's one of the most exciting things about having him here in this country as well. One of my fellow, fellow colleagues, Philip Olsen, who you may well know, um, is a fairly hard taskmaster when it comes to uh, human rights academics, advocates, and he sings his other praises extraordinarily and said, we have to get him down here, which is why he's come. So thank you for coming down. It's his second visit to Australia. Um, as part of his stay, he'll be also teaching the master's program. So I'm hoping some of his students are hiding in the class here this evening on business and human rights. But tonight, his role is to address us on the subject, and very importantly, given recent events in this country, the future of human rights rising to the populist challenge. Please make him feel very welcome. Thank you. Thank you, John, and thanks everyone for coming tonight despite the weather. And uh, thanks, for, uh, thanks to the Human Rights Law Center for the invitation and for co-sponsoring this event. Um, it is a real pleasure to come back to this law school. I had a fantastic time teaching uh, the Business and Human Rights Seminar last year despite the very intensive uh, um, work pace. And I see that no student from last year came back, so I'm, I'm getting worried. I'm seeing that maybe some of the, my new students are showing up. Uh, but um, uh, I, I kept in touch with some of the students from last year, and it has really been a, a pleasure to uh, get to know better this community here, both uh, the scholarly and the um, uh, advocacy community. And one of the things, one of the reasons why I try to uh, come back uh, here and continue to engage with um, Australian colleagues is because there is this disconnect pre precisely because of geographic and and, um, and legal and, and cultural distances between Australia and many other parts of the world, certainly the part of the world that I come from, Latin America, it rarely engages with what happens here. But uh, my experience last year uh, confirmed that there are many challenges and ideas and, and opportunities in common. Um, and the recent election outcomes confirmed precisely that. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do uh, today is two things. I was torn between 
uh, giving a lecture on my um, more, more, most recent book, which is a co-edited volume on populism and human rights. It's called Rising to the Populist Challenge. So Phil Balson precisely wrote, um, actually gave a lecture at LSE <clears throat> a couple of years ago, in which he said, well, there's this global challenge to human rights coming from populist movements and governments, from the right and the left. Right? So um, I, we, along with my colleague Chris Gomez from the Philippines, we decided to bring together a group of scholars and activists from around the world struggling with the issues and the challenges from those movements, uh, populist movements, um, uh, that have a very powerful, potent, efficacious anti-rights rhetoric and a set of measures that look very much alike. So what we did in that book, um, Rising to the Populist Challenge, was take stock of the attacks against civil society and human rights organizations uh, and the narratives that these uh, leaders were using in places as different as India, Turkey, um, uh, Venezuela, so I'm picking the ones that would look more uh, <coughs> unlike each other to you so that you get a sense of how widespread the, the um, phenomenon is and also how uh, different they are on, their, on, the, on paper in terms of ideology, right? So f all the way from uh, Correa's uh, Ecuador uh, five years ago to Maduro's Venezuela to Erdogan's Turkey to Narendra Modi who just got re-elected and has a stronger mandate to go after the Muslim minorities in, in, in India to uh, you name it. So the US, UK, uh, uh, Hungary, Poland, uh, these are all data points or, or case studies for this um, uh, this phenomenon that, for lack of a better term, because this is an equivocal term, populism, and I'll have to say more about that and I'll define more precisely what I mean by populism, but we understand that this wave of populist movements are uh, uh, raising serious challenges to the uh, to human rights norms and values. So, <clears throat> so that's that's the book, and I <clears throat> I first thought of giving the lecture just on that piece. But then I, I thought that um, also because, as John said, uh, I have one one foot in academia and one foot in, in human rights advocacy, and that I. I've seen so much anxiety, especially in the practitioners' <coughs> circles, on what the future will hold, uh, will bring for human rights practice. And there's this existential anxiety about whether the movement, the human rights movement, is a moment of crisis. Right? And I ran a number of workshops in 2016 in, in Asia, Latin America, Europe, and, 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 um, and uh, Africa with human rights leaders. And the question <coughs> that was put together by the Open Society Foundations. The question that, uh, uh, that brought us together was precisely whether the human rights movement was in a moment of, of transformation or whether, whether this was a moment of terminal crisis. And that, that conversation, that question, has also gotten some traction in, in academic circles. Books like Stephen Hopgood's uh, The End Times of Human Rights or uh, Sam Moyne's The Last Utopia uh, paint a pretty grim picture, grim picture of uh, prospects for human rights work. Um, and if one were to accept their arguments, and I don't have time to elaborate on them, happy to, to, to engage with those arguments in, in the Q&A um, uh, se section of today's uh, lecture. But the, the message is that this is the end game for human rights, and we better find uh, an alternative discourse for emancipatory causes, right? That, that, that we had a good run, depending on where you start counting. We had 70 years, 70 years, uh, uh, you know, from, since the declaration, the UN declaration, or 40, 50 years from the time when organizations like Amnesty International were established. But it's about time to wrap up and, and move on. Uh, that's the message from those. And these are sympathetic critics. I mean, these are progressive critics. If you read uh, the work of people like um, uh, Eric Posner, uh, a conservative legal scholar uh, from the U.S., well, the whole project of international human rights law was doomed from the beginning. It was a bad idea, right? So this the combination of anxiety in, in, in practitioner circles and uh, skepticism and criticism of the terminal kind 
in, in some in academic quarters make for a formidable challenge. So these are not regular times. This is not the uh, uh, early 1990s or late 1990s where when terms like the norms cascade, right, uh, that uh, people like Sunstein and Catherine Thicken um, uh, uh, <coughs> created to show or to capture this process whereby one country after another was adopting human rights treaties. Right, so, so it's a, it was a moment of expansion. Uh, clearly, we're a moment of contraction, or at least pause. And this is the moment of, of anxiety that I am trying to capture in the, the book manuscript that I'm working on, which is called Disrupting Human Rights. So this is the title of the talk. I don't know how much you see of this. Is, is this can you see the, the slide? So, so? OK. Oh, so if I move this. OK, smart. Uh, slideshow. So, <clears throat> um, so he knows that I'm not saying anything important. So, uh, it's, it's like whenever this guy says something important, I light up. And so, uh, um, so this is. So I'm gonna. I decided to combine both uh, the two presentations into one, and to make it easier for you to follow the two pieces, I even color coded them. So whenever you see yellow. That's the more forward-looking project, the new manuscript that I'm working on, the, on the future of human rights. And that's why the title of today's talk had two pieces to it, the future of human rights rising to the populist challenge. Right? So I couldn't make up my mind, so I decided I'm doing two, the two presentations in one. So hopefully it'll make sense to you. Um, so on the, on the challenges. The problem is that the existential anxiety comes from the fact that too many things are happening too fast at the same time, right? So the rise of China, which is the, the more direct way to say that the world is becoming more multipolar with very direct implications for human rights policies. As you may know, for example, China is bankrolling the new Egyptian capital. It's, a, it's a, in my own corner of the world, it's bankrolling uh, all, the, all kinds of infrastructure projects uh, from dams in the Amazon region uh, to ports to you name it. And there's no human rights conditionality attached to any of that. So no questions asked. Uh, Brazil, I was in Brazil just last week working with the Brazilian organizations. And, uh, and as you may have heard, uh, Jair Bolsonaro, this authoritarian uh, uh, kind of cartoon-like character, this is, uh, has promised to open um, the Amazon to business for business. And uh, he has the backing of Chinese investors who are not asking any questions, right? I'm very happy for him to uh, clear the forest and open up business opportunities for um, uh, Chinese uh, corporations and state enterprises. So uh, the rise of China, less multipolar world, the end for all practical purposes of Pax Americana. If there was any doubt about that, well, Trump make sure that we get the message that that's, that world order is over. And uh, even if it comes back, it won't come back in, the, uh, in, in, the, in its old shape. Second one, technological disruption. So the fact, and this is something that we discussed in the Business and Human Rights uh, Seminar, the fact that, that um, um, technology corporations are wreaking havoc with the basic concepts and mechanisms of human rights and democracy. And it's, you know, just have to look at uh, the scandals surrounding Facebook these days to realize that uh, this is a challenge, it's an unprecedented challenge, both in terms of the uh, scale and the, the power of these corporations and in, 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 the, in the kind of penetration uh, of those technologies in the fabric of the, the of democratic institutions. So, you know, there's been an, a whole industry of books asking whether democracies, how democracies die, right? That this is uh, Ziblet and, and, uh, and uh, Levitsky's book, uh, engage somehow with technology, but after all the <clears throat> revelations about uh, Cambridge Analytica and Facebook, and again, Brazil, Brazil's uh, election, was heavily influenced by a rumor spread through WhatsApp, right? which is a property of Facebook. So this is not just a momentary challenge, but an existential challenge to um, basic human rights uh, concepts and, 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 and norms. If you may have seen uh, um, uh, Yuval Harari's, the uh, Israeli historian's uh, latest book, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, I think he gets it right when he says that 
the basic concept of human autonomy, right? Autonomy. So it's at the heart of human rights. If you cannot choose, then it's hard to argue that you are, uh, uh, that in any meaningful way, you are a hum human rights uh, holder, right? But the fact is, as we know, that our behavior is being constantly manipulated, nudged by, through many mechanisms that have to do with ownership of data. So Facebook and Amazon know what's better than we do. Uh, and and that, that's serious trouble for uh, democracy and for human autonomy. So that's, that's another set of challenges that uh, compounds the, the, the picture. If, if all of that were not enough, climate change is here, right? It's not coming, it arrived. And so I cannot, I, I don't have to say, at a ward here, we're in Australia, so uh, we watched in horror what was happening in the, um, in the summer last, uh, earlier this year. And, uh, and the good thing is that we have powerful messengers for this um, reality, which is, uh, you know, the, the, basically the, uh, young people who are striking every Friday uh, and reminding us of the urgency and the scale of this challenge, right? Which was treated as, uh, as something smaller and something less important than it should have uh, by my generation and now the future generations or the younger generations are reminding us that we wasted the, the key 30 years that we had to do, to take measures that would be more gradual, gradual in nature. Now we have to uh, have 11 years to have carbon emissions, basically. And that, that level, that, the urgency and the scale of that challenge, I think, is finally being conveyed uh, eloquently by a social movement, in this case of young people. And, and finally, and I don't mean, I, I, I promise that the second half of my presentation will be optimistic. I'm an optimist. I'm a half glass full type of person. Um, and otherwise, I would have never survived in Colombia. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, but uh, but uh, to compound and to um, uh, uh, kind of uh, round up this, this um, quick list of challenges, there's backlash. And the only way that I can portray this without spending too much time on this is with this slide, right? <laughs> so I've given this talk several times on populism and I keep updating this slide and there's no more space, right? I, I'm missing some key people here. I actually don't know enough. I followed with interest what's happening in, in, in Australia, but I don't know enough about the context to uh, add confidently Scott Morrison to this uh, slideshow, but you'll uh, teach me whether I should or, or I shouldn't because there's Australia is, uh, different in many ways, but in, definitely these people uh, are very much like each other. And we, and I'm not saying this lightly, we looked at it with a group of researchers, we looked at the list of measures, laws, decrees, administrative measures, that all these people had passed in their countries, you know, all the way from, uh, the, from Putin, who was an, a pioneer, to the person whom I think is the, is the smart, smartest, the most sophisticated populist institution builder, who's this person right here, right? Viktor Orban uh, from Hungary. Small country, 10 million people, but really kind of headquarters of uh, populist rhetoric and, um, and institution building. He's been very patient. He's done, and then this is for, I guess this, there's a majority of lawyers here, the, the beauty or the horror of, of what he's done is that he's chipped away at the, the at democratic institutions one step at a time. Right? He, he, Fifteen years ago, when I first <coughs> wrote on cons comparative constitutional law, the Hungarian Constitutional Court was uh, an, an exemplar, exemplary court for the world. Now, the perfect example of a transplant that works. Right, so you uh, transplant an institution from the west to the east, and it's working beautifully. Well, he was patient enough to uh, chip away at the uh, chip away the independence of the court within the confines of the of the rules of the game. He's 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 been so patient that he has had to violate very few rules of the game because he's changed them he's changed them one by one. And this is what 
uh, an organization, fantastic organization that's going through very difficult times in Venezuela, uh, as everyone is going through a difficult time in Venezuela these days. Provea is the name of the organization. They published a fantastic report in 2017 when Maduro, right here, I'm here, um, he's still that cheerful despite the fact that uh, Venezuela is the Latin American Syria, basically. So, and, and also I use this slide because sometimes there's kind of misunderstandings and, and, and misinformation about um, some of these countries. And, uh, but I, to my mind, after doing all the research on what these governments have done against human rights organizations and institutions, they look very much alike. So Maduro's uh, law against uh, foreign funding for NGOs looks very much unlike uh, Orban's uh, law in Hungary. Although they're kind of stand and bearers of the right, Orban, and the left, Maduro, right? So this cuts across the ideological uh, divide. And what they've done, and if you're interested in, in, in looking at the details in the book, we have a whole appendix, in a, a, a large appendix, pretty boring but useful for researchers, that looks at how administrative measures against NGOs, for example, compare to each other. Sometimes they, they look as if they had been just translated uh, on Google, right? So you took, uh, you take uh, the foreign funding law in, in, in Turkey, translated into uh, Filipino, and you have the Turkish law. Um, and, and, and these people have learned from each other. Right? And this is not a secret anymore. So Netanyahu, just re-elected, and Orban, uh, who got a stronger mandate last year, attended Bolsonaro's, yeah, he's Bolsonaro, the guy shooting, he's always shooting something, uh, 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 up there, uh, uh, the, his inauguration, right? So there is, and as you know, Steve Bannon wanted even to create a, a formal uh, uh, coalition of right-wing populist movements and governments in, in Europe. He called it the movement. And this is one thing that I'm gonna end up with. The messaging is pretty powerful. Right, so, so the movement, and, and he, said, he said when he created the movement, uh, Bannon trying to bring together Le Pen and, uh, and Salvi in, in, in Italy and so on, he said, well, this is a grassroots movement uh, to try to push out the elites, right, which is a theme in, in all these uh, populist governments. So let me move on, and, and quickly, I won't spend much time on any definition because I want to get to the punchline and I still leave uh, time for questions and reactions. I want to be a bit more precise about what I mean by populism because populism can be an equivocal term. There is a progressive populist um, tradition, certainly in, in Latin America, for instance, in, in the 1950s, 1960s, populists would be the ones advocating for um, egalitarian policies. In the US, for example, 19th century populism is all about uh, 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 social inclusion. What I, what, I, what, I, what I and many other uh, analysts mean by this, by this wave of populism um, of the type that uh, Provea, uh, I forgot to, uh, to tell you what Provea said in that report in 2017. So what Provea said about Maduro was that um, his was a 21st century dictatorship, right? So it's not, uh, and what they meant by that was to distinguish uh, Maduro's regime from, say, the military juntas, the military uh, governments of the 1970s in Argentina or Chile, Pinochet, etc., the, the, the well-known bad guys from those days, who would get to power through military coups, right? But none of these guys got to power through coups. They were elected. Right, so this is the challenge. The challenge is that uh, human rights are being undermined from within, right, by democratically elected governments. Uh, true enough, many of them go on to uh, tinker and to, and to um, uh, dismantle the rules of the game so as to re-elect themselves, right, to perpetuate themselves with power. So in 2017, what Provea said in, in Venezuela was, well, well, now that Maduro, Nicolas Maduro, is um, postponing regional elections because he knows that if he holds them now, he's going to lose them, well, that's the end of democracy. Not even a minimalist definition of democracy uh, would allow us to brand that government as a democracy anymore. So there's a tipping point. There's a tipping point. And, and one of the most interesting academic work on democracy that's being done is trying to find early warnings. 
So when do you know that you're going down uh, the authoritarian path? And when do you know you're no longer a democracy? Right? So one, one safe bet is when, you, when the government uh, tinkers with the uh, electoral rules, right? Which, as you know, some of these people are doing. Er Erdogan just, uh, just called a new election in Istanbul because he lost it. Right? So through his electoral co co uh, commission, he's trying to rerun the, um, the election in Istanbul, which he lost. So that's a, a sure sign that something is, <coughs> is very wrong about a democracy. <coughs> um, but uh, in general, what, what's difficult about uh, these governments and these movements is that most of them have remained within the confines of electoral democracy. You may, if you have a thicker understanding of what democracy is, uh, if you think that democracy also means some substantive content in terms of um, redistribution or social and economic rights, well, uh, many of these governments are, uh, cease to be um, democracies a long time ago. But even if you have, not to go into those conceptual uh, debates, but even if you have a pretty standard uh, procedural understanding of democracy. <coughs> the problem is that many of these governments are winning elections or, or getting reelected. Just look at what happened here last week. Um, so, uh, populism of this type uh, has gotten a lot of attention. There's even a whole uh, website put together by The Guardian on, on an index on populism, right? And, on, and you can even take a quiz to see how populist you are. Um, and you can see where uh, where you are closer to uh, Merkel or Bernie Sanders or Viktor Orban and so on. Um, the the what I want to um, uh, highlight here is that this type of populism is a combination of two traits. One is anti-elitism, but this is you know uh, Bernie Sanders is anti-elitist. Many um, a lot of progressive politics is anti-elitist in that in, in that it is uh, egalitarian. But a second component and a necessary condition is that um, it be uh, anti pluralist So this is a populism that combines anti-elitism and anti pluralism and, uh, and this is, and the anti pluralism bit is what makes um, the, uh, this quite challenging for human rights. Um, the expression, the quote, the sentence that sums this up more eloquently and more brutally that I know of is what type Erdogan said in Congress once to the opposition. He said, well, we are the people. Who are you? But who are you? All right? And so this is uh, the incarnation of the people in one individual, one movement. Um, and uh, so at the heart of populism is uh, it's a moral statement as opposed to a legal or political statement, which is a clear division of the national polity between us versus them, right? So that's is, uh, and there's a whole, uh, now uh, there's a sophisticated populism index that uses precisely this definition of, of divisive politics, divisive rhetoric. And this takes many different forms, but again, it looks like taken from the same uh, playbook. So, you know, the, the enemies of the people, the fake media, the fake news, uh, which is the language that Trump uses, Putin has said this about many, many people, like uh, uh, the, uh, the dissenters. Uh, Duterte's main uh, cause is against uh, um, um, so, quote unquote, uh, drug dealers, but as you know, he's been pretty brutal uh, in, in the treatment of anyone who opposes his government. Again, it's the corrupt them versus the, uh, the uh, authentic us. Um, uh, this is Maduro holding the little constitution that he basically destroyed in, in, in Venezuela um, by appointing an, a, a constitutional assembly that uh, decides on everything he wants to. And, and, he, and again, it's the U, in his case, it's the U.S., right? So the imperialism is used as the us, the, 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 us, the patriots, and the Ven real Venezuelans against the them, which includes, sadly, tragically, for Maduro, all the billions of people uh, uh, which, who have migrated from Venezuela because of the co economic collapse. So it's them, right? The, 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 not the real Venezuelans. And for people like Orban, it's the, the Roma population, the immigrants, and so on. But it's always this 
uh, and just last week with Narendra Modi, uh, it's the Hindu versus the Muslims, right? The real Indians versus the rest. And, and this is uh, what makes, and this is the politics of fear, and I'll get to emotions in a moment. The, what, the emotional fabric of this politics is fear and anger. There's a fantastic book by, a, by an Indian uh, journalist writer by the name of Pankaj Mishra uh, called The Age of Anger. Right? And I think he gets it right. It's, it's a whole zeitgeist. zeitgeist. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a spirit of the time in which the mobilization of a certain emotional qualities, uh, 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 namely fear and anger, is driving uh, this type of attack against uh, human rights. And what does it look like? And I'll, I'll go through this very quickly because I want to get back to the uh, forward-looking view of human rights and some hopeful notes in closing. So uh, it, it's, it includes three things. Uh, attempts to hijack the state apparatus. So it's not true that the populists of the world are deregulators. They regulate heavily. They reshape. They're, they're very good lawyers. They're, they're legal engineers. They spent a lot of time rewriting laws, rewriting constitutions, like Orban did, um, but to hijack the state apparatus in their favor. Uh, corruption and mass clientelism, and then systemic efforts to, su to suppress civil society. And I'm going to uh, stop for a moment here with uh, systemic efforts to suppress civil society, uh, because this gets us as kind of a, a, a simple diagnosis of the repertoire of uh, measures that these governments take against human rights organizations and human rights actors. It's not just human rights organizations, civil society, independent civil society, including the media, including some business associations uh, that uh, <coughs> stand in opposition to them. So one can classify all, the, all, the, all those measures, all those attacks um, into two categories. One is uh, attacks against the efficacy of those organizations, and the second one is, against, is attacks against uh, le their legitimacy. And these are very different types of attacks, but together make for a very potent combination. So efficacy, now the standard measure that these governments have taken is to starve uh, um, um, organizations uh, of foreign funds. Uh, sadly, the human rights and, and the human rights movement has some structural weaknesses. I wrote in, uh, in Open World Rights, which is um, a human rights portal, full disclosure, now I co-direct it, so this is also a plug. So, so it is, Open World Rights uh, has run a series on, on, the, on reforms that human rights organizations and human, the human rights movement should uh, undertake to kind of, to, to be less exposed to this type of attacks. And one, structural vulnerability of human rights organizations, especially in other parts of the world, in most of the world, is that they're heavily dependent on foreign funding, right? Philanthropies, international philanthropies, uh, foreign aid, and so on. And the easiest thing to do, these populist leaders have found out, is to cut off those funds. Because it's easy. It's easy to, to track down financial flows. So what is it? It's impossible to fund a human rights organization with money from the Ford Foundation or, or Open Society Foundations in India these days, for instance. There's no way to do that. There's no way to do that. The government tracks everything down, and, and, and it's banned that. And it's banned that with uh, an idea that comes from Putin, which is the, uh, the foreign agent law. Right? Basically, if you, get, if you receive funds for uh, doing human rights work, you're branded as a foreign agent, and then you're sent to prison uh, for a, a while because you're a traitor, right? So, so that's the type of campaigns against efficacy. What Bolsonaro in Brazil did was first day in office, everyone is on the, is on the beach, uh, January 1st in Brazil. He issues a decree written most likely by the military members of, of his government. A third of his cabinet uh, are former military members and members of the military. And, and Bolsonaro uh, gets uh, or just a, 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 a widespread audit of all NGOs in Brazil. So you can say, well, I have the, this capacity to oversee you and to, uh, and to, and to watch you. Uh, and second, uh, second type of, of uh, attacks have to do with le the legitimacy of organizations. And I'm going to spend the rest of my talk <clears throat> addressing mostly this type of challenge because it has to do with language, with narratives, with how human rights are talked about, and so and, and with Tom and the colleagues at the 
at the center, we've discussed this because it's a challenge for everyone, not just in Australia, how to respond to um, attacks against human rights, or how to speak about human rights in ways that, is, that are engaging, that resonate with the larger public, that they not sound like for a, a, a human rights lecture or human rights course, but that make sense to what many organizations like Amnesty International are calling the persuadable middle. Right? In highly polarized societies, and we live in a highly polarized world, there's you know, staunch defenders of human rights values, and then strong, staunch uh, opposition to those values, and then there's a large section of the population in between. You know, depending on where you look at, it's 30% on one side, 30% on the other, and 40% in the middle. That's roughly what they make up in many countries. Maybe in Australia it's different, but the question is how do we, how we, how do we stop preaching to the core? Uh, and how can we meaningfully engage with organizations that are non-professional human rights organizations, that are social movements like faith-based organizations, and labor organizations, youth organizations, or individuals that communicate through uh, social media that have, can be supporters of human rights value but would not self-identify as human rights uh, uh, defenders and would be turned off by explicit human rights language of the kind that used to do the trick in the 1990s or, or, or before. I've had these conversations with, I won't name names because maybe this is being recorded, but uh, with some of the leaders of large INGOs. Um, and, uh, and, and my objection in those conversations has been, well, the, the, the thing, what, they, what they say is, well, well, look, we've been around for 50 years, so I'm already giving out too much information. So I've been around for 50 years. Naming and shaming has done the trick. So we've, we've you know, brought down uh, authoritarian governments. We've uh, freed up prisoners of conscience around the world. And, uh, and naming and shaming has, has, uh, is a proven strategy. Name and shame meaning uh, uh, publishing reports that are technical in nature that basically are a syllogism. So this is, this is what the UN Declaration or the X Treaty says, and this is what this government is doing, therefore there's a violation of human rights. You publish that, get that, get that out uh, in the media, hopefully a high visibility a media outlet, and you shame government, that government, into compliance. That world is not out there anymore. First, facts are not what they used to be. So they can be easily contested in, in, in social media fragmented ecosystem. Well, we, we know what facts are, right? So facts get, get made up. Uh, so just tell the truth is not enough. Second, are you gonna shame the shameless, right? So, so who, who, these people are shameless. You know, there's no way to shame them in the way that they're not gonna speak against each other. So, and, 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 and fourth, Compliance with human rights uh, standards is much more complicated than that. So uh, legitimacy uh, means attacking the basis of, of, of um, you know, of the, of, of the credibility of human rights language and actors. And so there needs to be some creative thinking about that. And, and that goes, and this is the last bit of my presentation, to the issue of, of narratives. <clears throat> um, and this is... Uh, Hillary Clinton got asked <clears throat> by The Guardian recently what, what she would suggest to movements in Europe trying to push back against the populace. What type of narrative would she use? And she, for the first time ever that I've seen her say this, she said, I don't know. Right? I don't know. So she knows, you know, she's very opinionated about everything, but about this she said, I'm clueless. And Tony Blair said the same thing basically in the interview that he gave for that series. <clears throat> so, um, last bit on, on, on the um, uh, zooming out now, what this means for the future of human rights. One can have different positions about this. One can be, and, and, and I, because I've spent a lot of, uh, of time on populism, this might paint kind of a, a, a pessimistic um, a picture of, of the future of human rights. I actually think there's a lot that's being done at the local level that already, <clears throat> that already kind of embodies seeds of responses, of solutions to these issues that, I, that hopefully will work out in the, uh, in the short term and, and definitely in the, in the long term. Um, I, again, going back to the question of are we in a moment of crisis or transition, um, 
I, for the reasons that you can fathom now, I'm not in the end times uh, camp, nor am I in the business as usual camp. So this is, this is where a lot of people in the human rights uh, practitioners and academic communities find themselves. Some being incredibly pessimistic, saying this is time to move on. Some others, like the old timers saying, well, <clears throat> this is a glitch. Things will go back to, to, to normal. So why would we give up language and strategies that have worked for so long and have done so much good? True, they've done uh, a lot of good, but uh, I don't think for the reasons that I just explained that they'll be uh, helpful uh, at least by themselves anymore. So there's two other positions in the, in the literature and in the debate that I find much more constructive, and this is what I would want to propose in terms of the tone of the conversation going forward. One is reflexive reconstruction, and doing some repair while we're trying to stay afloat. Um, and the best exemplar of this view, to my mind, is a book by Catherine Seking, um, who's a well-known scholar of human rights uh, uh, movements. Uh, the book is entitled Evidence for Hope. Fantastic book that engages constructively, but frankly, with the critics on the end times people, <clears throat> but, uh, but also offers some ideas. And, and there's a reason why it's called Evidence for Hope. Uh, and, and I'll pick up on the hope part uh, in a moment. So she said, well, we, we, you definitely have to recalibrate, but there's no reason why this is the end times of human rights. I, I used to have to hold that same position, mm. and, and my blog entries in Open Law Rights have, have mostly been in this vein, but since running those workshops in 2016 about the moment of crisis transformation, I've seen very little movement, right? And, and there's no enough sense of urgency, and I'm talking about the activist crowd. <clears throat> We're too slow to react. Uh, so, so we, there's a lot of, in any professional uh, field, and this is Organizational Sociology 101, there's a temptation to continue do, to do things as they've been done for a long time, right? So, so if, if, and the human rights movement uh, has, has achieved major victories everywhere. <clears throat> but so it's hard to change the modus operandi, the way of doing things. Plus, there's a whole industry, uh, right, of, of, uh, of, um, academic programs, of funding organizations, of, of publishers. There's a whole human rights sector, right, that's gotten too professionalized. And that means that there's not enough creativity and there's not enough openness to dialoguing with other fields of practice and, 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 and thinking that have been through difficult times recently. So if I were to choose one field to learn from, it would be journalism. I wish that the human rights organizations, uh, the largest ones, were as creative as The Guardian or The New York Times are these days. Right? That they keep churning out uh, innovations one after another. And I've, done, I've seen what interesting work that The Guardian has done in, in Australia, for instance. And, uh, and, and the reason why they had to do that is that they, will, they went almost bankrupt. Right? So journalists did this because, not because they're, part, yeah, they're smart, they're dedicated people, but they're not smarter or more dedicated than human rights scholars or activists. But they, they, they saw the writing on the wall, and they say, well, we're going to go bankrupt. This is not, no, we're not going to sell those printed, uh, print papers anymore, and we're not going to live off um, advertising. So we need to come up with different alternatives. That, unluckily, unfortunately, the human rights movement is too dependent of the, on funding sources that continue to keep organizations afloat. I'm not meaning, and I, I, I co-founded, as John said, a human rights organization in Colombia, and I'm very committed to it. I'm happily no longer the ED, so that's why I get to come to Australia and talk leisurely about all these things. But, but, yeah. but we're, too deep, we're too confident about uh, you know, the perpetuation of the world as it is. So there's no sense of crisis. And I think we need more of a, of a sense of crisis without the demobilizing effects of, of, of what a crisis framework uh, entails. You probably have seen uh, the, uh, Greta Thunberg, the, the great uh, young climate activist, and she says, well, we need cathedral thinking, right? So just as everyone mobilized around and donated uh, for, to the, for the rebuilding of Notre Dame, we would need that for climate change, but also that kind of urgent thinking and innovative thinking for human rights. 
because otherwise we're sitting ducks and, and I'm concerned about that, that lack of, of, of response. And this is why the book is, the idea in the book is constructive disruption, right? It's, it's, uh, innovations and interventions, uh, campaigns and uh, modes of collaboration, modes of working <clears throat> that gets us going faster, that disrupt. I know this is a Silicon Valley term and it's usually uh, uh, used by the uh, Ubers of the world, but I don't mean uh, uh, disruption in that way of breaking stuff, like they say. Uh, uh, but some, some, some uh, strategies and many modes of thinking in human rights uh, deserve disrupting and are ripe for disrupting. Uh, and, uh, and this is, and I'll end here with uh, some ideas, the quick ideas. I, uh, this, is where, this is the part that I feel most passionate about, the most optimistic part, the part that I uh, have uh, very little time to, to develop, actually no time, so I'll just, I'll just end with this. Yeah. One, one way to, to uh, so this is just uh, um, a laundry list of ideas, if anyone is interested in any of those, this is exactly what I'm working on, so be happy to elaborate. One, one thing that's crucial is to, to develop a, a, a sense of longer term thinking in human rights. No, we tend to think in one, two, three year planning cycles. So if you ask, uh, if you get funding for five years, that's, you, you know, that's dream, uh, dream in, in human rights circles. But as it so happens, the structural challenges that we're facing in human rights, those are long term ones, right? 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. And many uh, targets of human rights activism, certainly business, think long term, right? So, so think what the oil industry did. They knew back in the late 1980s that climate change was for real. And they, they had a plan. They had a plan to sabotage climate action, action against climate change. And they, they deployed a, a very uh, effective uh, plan that got us uh, stranded, got us uh, demobilized for three decades. Uh, and uh, so that if there, if only, if there were longer term uh, horizons, uh, human rights uh, organizations could be more uh, prepared for, to, for the challenges that, that, um, that we're facing. Um, then there's the issue of deep drivers. It's hard, we were talking with Tom and Karen the way here, how it is difficult for human rights activists to take a step back from the grind of daily work and think about structural issues under, underlying uh, our work. But unless we do that or someone does that systematically, we're always gonna be on the defensive. And this is how it feels to do human rights activism these days, to be on the defensive. So the, it's, it's just last week in, in Brazil. So Bolsonaro does an outrageous thing every day. So, so uh, Bolsonaro is Trump on steroids or on, on some sort of crazy medication because it's, uh, you know that his sons changed their password to his Twitter account for three days and tweeted in, instead of him and he didn't know. And so <clears throat> it's, it's a whole tragic uh, comedy every day. But uh, so everyone is trying to stop the very Brazilian terms, the latest goal from uh, um, uh, Bolsonaro. It's on the defensive, eternally on the defensive, unless we took a uh, uh, look at and take seriously these deep drivers of challenges to human rights. Technology, inequality, rising inequality is another one. Uh, then the powerful narratives being put forth by the, the populace and ecological risks. I already said, well, learning from other fields, is also something, some, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, um, a shortcut towards responding quickly uh, to uh, the challenges of populism. And, and I'll end with this, <coughs> narratives. I don't have time to, this is exactly what we're working on with the center uh, and with other organizations around the world, trying to come up with ways of talking about human rights that are more engaging, that, that resonate with the wider public, that create bridges as opposed to alienating potential allies. And, and uh, I'll end with this quote from Harari's book. He, you may, if you've read any of his books, you would know that his basic argument, and he just published a great op-ed in the New York Times uh, about why humans, we humans are so gullible when it comes to uh, false stories, right? And this argument is that we became dominant in the planet and potentially capable of destroying the planet because unlike other animals, 
we're capable of sharing stories, so believing common stories. So we believe that the dollar, a dollar bill is worth something, even if it's a piece of paper. We, li we believe no one has seen human rights walk around, and we believed, we believed for a while in human rights. We believed in democracy, in religions, and so on. And that shared knowledge, shared belief, has allowed us to co cooperate at a scale that no other species has uh, figured out how to do, right? So, and, but this reminds us, importantly, that human rights, in the end, are a story, right? They're a story that needs to be, needs some convincing. So it's not self-evident. It is what uh, many human rights practitioners act as if human rights were self-evident. And no, no, there's that in the American Declaration, all that self-evident truths. Well, not really, right? So, so this is <clears throat> what Harari 